So I'm going to talk today about curiosity and not the rover. You have another talk about the rover. In 1994, a comet came very, very close to Jupiter, so close that because of Jupiter's gravity, it broke it to some two dozen fragments like this. And we took this image with the Hubble Space Telescope. We called it the string of pearls. And we calculated that each one of these fragments was going to hit the atmosphere of Jupiter, one by one. But we had no idea whether we would actually see anything, because simulations showed that if these fragments were smaller than maybe half a mile or so, they would just go in and you would not see anything. You know, like you throw a small pebble into a pond, nothing happens. So there we were, all gathered <laughs> around an old computer screen. I'm there too, uh, sort of kind of at the top with much darker hair, so maybe you don't recognize me. <laughs> when the first fragment was about to hit, and we wanted to know what's happening. And, you know, if I had to give a title to this photo, which was taken by a journalist without us knowing, I would call this photo Curiosity. This is what this photograph is all about. It shows, in this particular case, scientific curiosity. Now, as soon as I saw this picture, I happened to be an art fanatic as well, it reminded me of a painting that was painted some almost 400 years before that. It's called The Lesson in Anatomy by Rembrandt. And look at that. Rembrandt really didn't care about the corpse that's there. He, all he cared is about the curiosity on the faces of the people around. I mean, just take a look at these two images. One, <laughs> two. It's the same picture, right? It's a picture of curiosity. By the way, if you're curious to know what we actually saw, then here it is. We first saw a point of light that became bigger, mushroomed, and fell back onto Jupiter's surface. Basically, it was almost like a nuclear mushroom rising above Jupiter's surface with the first fragment hit. And actually, those fragments, they left scars in the atmosphere of Jupiter, which stayed there for months, and we followed them, and we could study how the motions are in the atmosphere of Jupiter. Now, when is it that we get curious? Broadly speaking, there are two types of things that really get us curious. I mean, there are details, but broadly speaking, one type of thing that gets us curious is things that really surprise us. Things where, you know, we have a certain picture of how things should be, and something comes out that is, it's not quite like that. You know, I show you these crooked circles there, that's not very interesting. If I tell you these are perfect circles that are concentric, you say, no way. But here, I can plot on them perfect circles, and you see that they are. That is now surprising. You know, why is it like that? We would like to know what that is. A second thing that doesn't fail to surprise us is extreme outliers, things that don't conform. You know, something like this. <laughs> you know, this always surprises us. Why is that? Now, in this particular case, this is almost comic. But suppose I show you instead of that, these are the deviations from the average temperature in the past century in the US. Now, you don't have to be a meteorologist to understand this. Just look at the top curve there. That red line at the top there is this year. This is the hottest year on record. Now, I know there are some people who are not curious about this, <laughs> but, I'll tell you what, we are very curious about this, <laughs> and we would like to understand what's going on. So extreme outliers make us curious. There is a second thing that makes us extremely curious, and this is what you might call confounded evidence, which basically means something like this. You see something, there is a possible explanation, but there are other possible explanations, and you don't know which one is right. There are several possible theories. There are several possible continuations of the story, you know, and so on, and you don't know which one actually works. Do you recognize this? Does anybody recognize this film? Which one is it? <laughs> Casablanca, of course. I'm gonna show you a few seconds from this film, okay? Just a few seconds. So, 
you know, there may be a younger population here who have not watched Casablanca, but you know, most people have seen Casablanca. So here is, here is now that, that scene. The train leaves the ground and if you're not with him, you regret it. Maybe not today, maybe not tomorrow, but soon and for the rest of your life. What about us? And then when she says, but what about us? The computer starts buffering, the power goes off. You don't know what he answers. You know, this is just horrible. I mean, you have 217 possible continuations to this story. Now, does anybody actually know the line that he answers here? We'll always have Paris, one of the best lines in the film. So that's the kind of thing where you have confounded evidence. Another thing which psychologists actually like to use is they show you a picture that's blurry. And they ask you to think what it is. What is this? Like, you know, what do you think this might be? A balloon. A balloon, okay, somebody else? Saturn, okay. Well, actually, let's see, it's a pearl on the neck of Marilyn Monroe. <laughs> so, uh, you know, confounded evidence. You know, it could be this, it could be that, we don't know. These are the types of things that make us curious. Now, so I, I mentioned two things. Things that surprise us, confounded evidence. Now, have we always been curious? Are we curious from birth? Or is it something we learn, people tell us to be curious, and so on? Well, Laura Schultz from MIT does some incredible experiments with very little children, and I mean really little. I mean, in this particular case, the child here is a year and a half old. She does them with even smaller children. Now, what you're going to see here is that this young researcher shows the kid a certain toy. So uh, there is that toy, and she presses a button on that toy, and that makes some noise. Now, look, the kid already wants it. Now, she shows it to him or her again, pressing the button. The kid wants it. Now, the researcher shows the kid that she has in a box two other toys that look kind of like that toy, but they have a different color. And she leaves the child with that. The child immediately tries to press the button. It doesn't work. So the child has this idea. Maybe I'm doing something wrong. She's asking her parent. Did you see that? Now she comes, gives her a second toy, which looks a bit different. The child now thinks there is another possibility. The toy is broken. So now, but there is another one lying there. There, there is another one lying there. Look, the red one. So the child now, look what, what it, she does. <laughs> She pulls that thing to get that other toy. So the child could tell at this age that it was possible that she or he was doing something wrong or that there is something wrong with the thing itself. The child already, you know, was managing to distinguish this confounded type of evidence. Now, what happens in our brain when we're curious? You know, if you ask these questions 50 years ago, somebody would tell, what do I know? You can do these experiments in psychology, they tell us some, something about how our mind works, but what actually happens in, inside our brain, we couldn't tell. But now we can, because you can take people and you can stick them into a functional MRI machine, make them curious by one of those, you know, pictures, confounded evidence, and you check which regions in the brain light up when they actually are curious. And they find that these regions light up. Now, these regions are associated with hunger, with conflict. So we are kind of hungry for knowledge. You know, philosopher Thomas Hobbes once used to say, there is a lust for knowledge. Uh, and conflict, you know, when this confounded evidence, we cannot tell. These are the regions that light up. Now, 
what happens when we satisfy the curiosity? Like, you know, I showed you that picture and then showed you what it actually was. Then, this region lights up. This region in the brain is associated with a pleasure circuit. It lights up when we have good food, good wine, good sex. So being curious is like being hungry. Satisfying our curiosity is like having good sex. <laughs> so this is very important to know. Now, Plato, you know, he was one of the smartest people who ever lived. Uh, you know, philosopher Alfred North Whitehead once wrote that all of Western philosophy is a series of footnotes to Plato. Uh, Plato, in, in his dialogue, Meno, he asks the following question. He says, I, I'm paraphrasing a bit, but he, he poses this paradox. He says, when are we actually curious? You see, if I don't know anything about something, then I don't know what to be curious about, and I won't be curious. If I know everything about something, then I already know everything, and there is nothing to be curious about. So when is it that I get curious? He actually hit exactly upon what these psychologists are finding. Namely, if I plot knowledge one way and curiosity the other, you get something like an inverted U-shape. Namely, when you know very little, you're not curious. When you know a lot, you're not curious. You're curious when there is a gap between what you know and what you think could be known about this thing. That's when you really get curious. Now, scientists get especially curious about unexpected patterns. So for example, this is a cluster, a real cluster of stars. There are about 100,000 stars in this cluster, observed with the Hubble Space Telescope. So what astronomers did was that they actually arranged these stars first by their temperature. The hottest stars are blue, they are at the left. The coolest stars are red, they are on the right. Then they took these stars and they arranged them by how bright they are. The brightest at the top, the dimmest at the bottom. And whoa, what happened? All the stars in this cluster suddenly fall onto this pattern. Why don't they fill this entire diagram of temperature and brightness? It took astronomers a while to understand that stars actually evolve. They are born, they live, and they die. And these regions actually denote the places where they spend most of their lives. Like, you know, if I take a picture of a highway from above, if traffic is streaming, then I will see nothing. But if like 295 here, there's always some road work, you know, <laughs> cars accumulate where there is the road work, and that's the thing that you're gonna see. So this is what we're seeing here. But then they can do the following. They look at the galaxy that is near, very near our Milky Way. It's only about half a million light years away. That galaxy covers the entire image here. They removed all the other galaxies and took the stars and put them on this diagram. But now we can do something better. We start with the stars from when the galaxy was only one billion years old and let time evolve and see what the stars do. And look at what happens. This banana gets peeled like this and the stars evolve in this diagram just like this until we actually reach today. And you know what that today was for this particular galaxy? How far was that banana peeled? It was more than 13 and a half billion years. This particular galaxy is a fossil galaxy that's almost as old our universe is our universe. Our universe is 13.7 billion years old. This galaxy is older than 30 and a half billion years. But how did we find this? By being really curious about that pattern that we couldn't explain. By being curious about that pattern, we discovered a galaxy that's almost as old as the universe. Now, what has been the attitude towards curiosity over the centuries? Very mixed. 
you know, you start with Adam and Eve. <laughs> and, you know, Adam eats from the forbidden fruit. Some people would say this was the first scientific experiment. <laughs> but, of course, they get very seriously punished. They get very seriously punished for that. But, you know, they are punished really for disobedience, not so much for their curiosity. Then you take, do you remember the story of Lot? Lot and his wife. Uh, Lot lived in Sodom. God wanted to destroy Sodom. He told, wanted to save Lot and his family, told them to leave the town. But he told them, whatever you do, don't look back. W what happened? Lot's wife looked back, turned into this pillar of salt. She was some big woman, Lot's wife, I must say. <laughs> she turned into, into So again, it's disobedience that got punished. Let's look at children's stories. This is Sleeping Beauty. You know, the princess at age 16, she goes to explore the palace, breaks her finger, falls asleep for 100 years. Doesn't sound very promising for curiosity. But guess what? She gets the prince at the end. So a somewhat mixed message in all of this. Now, who is it that doesn't want you to be curious? Totalitarian regimes, people who have something to hide. You know, curiosity is the best remedy for fear. And we have actually seen this in a number of disciplines. Curiosity is what drives scientific research. This is the James Webb Space Telescope that we're now building, you know, to see the very first galaxies in the universe. You know, some people say, no, it only drives basic research, not applied research. You know what, on this I'm like my friend Martin Rees, who says, there are two kinds of research. There is applied research, and there is not yet applied research. <laughs> then it drives education. Yes, we heard so much about education. How do you make Kids learn by making them curious. That's the thing you really want to do. Make them curious. It drives all of advertising. <laughs> you know, we're all curious when we see something like this. <laughs> and it drives all storytelling. And by that I mean whether you write a book, whether you do a film, you make a TV program. You have a conversation. You want people to be curious, and there is nothing that makes them more curious than cliffhangers. You put in the story cliffhangers, and with the aid of Photoshop, I can even put myself hanging from that cliff <laughs> out there, even with the birds flying above me. Now, we recently had the best example of the power of curiosity that we've seen. And this is with this girl, Malala Yousafzai. Malala Yousafzai has, has put her life on the line to actually allow for curious young girls to get an education. So, you know, they say that curiosity is contagious. What I say to that, well, in that case, let's make it into an epidemic. <laughs> Thank you very much.